Yeah. So I guess we're we're live and um, good morning, everybody. This is the Senate Agricultural Committee on uh, Friday, the twenty what second, maybe or first. I don't know. Lose track of the days here. Um, but um, we're going to be talking this morning. Um, with our congressional delegation uh, people. Um, we have uh, Tom Barry with us, Erica Campbell. Uh, I don't know if Ryan's on yet or not. Um, Andrew, are, are you representing uh, one of the groups? Or are you on to listen? Yes, I am with Senator Leahy's office. Good morning. Yeah. Andrew is my DC colleague. He's the one that gets the stuff done. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's good to have somebody that'll get the stuff done, right? Um, but I'd like to have the committee introduce themselves um, so that we'll all we'll all know each other. We do have one new member on the uh, Senate uh, Ed Committee. So, uh, Mr. Vice Chairman, would you like to start? Be happy to. Good morning, everybody. Chris Pearson from the Chittenden District. Glad to have you here. Hi, all. I'm Anthony Polina of Washington County. Ryan Collimore representing the Rutland District. Welcome. And we also have Corey Parent from St. Albans, uh, Franklin County. And Sorry, um, I? I'm Corey. He's speechless. Are you my video went out, sorry about that, but Corey Parent from Franklin County. And um, I'm Bobby Shar from Essex, uh, Orleans County. Um, well, it's good to have you folks with us this morning. And I think uh, before, before we get started, um, on behalf of the committee, I'd like to thank you guys for being here and, and uh, thank your bosses for for all the hard work that they've been doing to um, through this pandemic to help um, us from monitors out and it certainly um, it certainly has been a great help to the state of Vermont and our you know our local citizens as well as our businesses around the state uh, you know, we've, we've had uh, dealer, farm equipment dealerships uh, in that have spoken, feed dealers, and, um, and they've all uh, been very grateful uh, for the financial help that has come from you folks in Washington, passed down to the states. And then we, we had, um, you know, the two ag committees set up a program for our agricultural uh, people. Um, so their accounts receivable have been halfway decent and their sales have been been uh, pretty stable. Uh, so it's it's really made a, a big difference to, uh, to our ag community as well as um, our all of our communities. So um, with that, we'd like to, uh, you know, we wanted to get you in to, to both thank you for what you've done in the past and give us a little overview on what you think may occur in the future and uh, move forward. Um, I don't know if there's any particular order that you want to go in, if some of you have time restraints. Uh, if we've got an hour, so if, but if there is not none, I would start with Tom and and then go to to Erica and then to Ryan. So um, I don't know if any of the committee members have anything to say before we get started or not. If if not, um, I'll turn it over to. Um, you, Tom. 
Well, thank you. I, you know, I think what we'll do is uh, sort of introduce ourselves and just a little bit of 30,000 foot perspective on, on where we are at the start of the Congress. And then uh, we can uh, take a deeper dive into some of the issues of interest. Uh, again, Tom Barry here, uh, I handle the state outreach side of Senator Leahy's agriculture, environment and energy portfolio. Uh, and uh, my colleague, Andrew, uh, can introduce himself. Uh, he takes the DC side of things. Um, and uh, I'm sure everybody on the call is familiar with uh, Senator Leahy's uh, current role, but um, you know, sort of where things stand right now, very obviously we have uh, in, a new incoming majority in the Senate and a new administration we're working with, with uh, the inauguration of President Biden. Uh, and so sort of big picture what that means. Senator Leahy uh, has been on the Senate, U.S. Senate Agriculture Committee uh, beginning in 1975, and I expect he will stay there uh, for this next 117th Congress. His other uh, committees are Judiciary and Appropriations, and his leadership role in this Congress uh, is as the chairman of the U.S. Senate Appropriations Committee. Uh, and we can get more into uh, what that means uh, as we have our conversation today. And he's also assumed the role of president pro tem of the Senate, which goes to the senior member of the majority party. Uh, and that role is to some extent ceremonial. Uh, he, he is, uh, you know, sits as the president of the Senate and is in the line of succession to the presidency uh, after the Speaker of the House. So um, it's an uh, important role, automatically makes him part of the Senate leadership team. And so, you know, the Senator's seniority has, has never been greater. Uh, his priorities will remain, uh, you know, strong on the areas that he's always represented on for agriculture. He's uh, seen as a dairy leader in the in the Senate, uh, he wrote the Organic Standards Act, et cetera. So, um, you know, we can take a deeper dive into what some of that looks like. The other, uh, you know, what we know about the change in administration, of course, is that uh, uh, Secretary Vilsack uh, is, has been nominated to uh, return as secretary. Uh, we knew him well as President Obama's Ag Secretary. And in that role, he was in Vermont twice. Uh, Early on, he came and attended the St. Albans Dairy Cooperative annual meeting as well as the NOFA annual meeting. And then he came back a few years later to announce additional funding for clean water and conservation programs uh, as we really, um, as a state began to tackle those issues. So uh, the con Andrew may know more or uh, Erica about the schedule for confirmation hearings, but with that, it's sort of, that's who I am and where we are with the, the new Congress, the new administration. Happy to hand it to uh, Erica. Yeah, uh, thank you, Tom. Welcome, Erica. Thanks, Senator Starr. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for having us today. Um, Erica Campbell, I work for Senator Sanders um, uh, on, as outreach rep and uh, policy advisor, uh, agriculture and nutrition is my main area, as well as uh, small business and economic development. And I won't say too much for my introduction. I'm looking forward to kind of getting into giving you an update today. I also cover nutrition issues for the Senator. Um, so looking forward to giving you a little update on that today and some of the small business provisions and how they've impacted agriculture in Vermont, um, as well as some of the new changes in the recent bill and um, how that will may look um, for a, uh, agriculture businesses accessing it this time around. Um, I just given um, giving a quick overview, um, Senator Sanders is uh, uh, is going to be chairing the budget committee and uh, that as a rank you know he's been ranking member um, in the minority for that uh, I think as a as a chair this is going to really take on a, a new role and a new prominence especially given, uh, the way in Washington that it's been uh, prominent to have uh, budget uh, reconciliation as part of the process, so to move bills forward. So certainly he is very willing and uh, to use that 
uh, to move important things forward, especially to address our coronavirus and our health crisis and uh, economic crisis um, and in a role in recovery, infrastructure development, et cetera, moving forward. So we will see what this session holds. Um, and uh, yeah, look, that's, look forward to giving you a little update today. Yeah. And Ryan? Yeah, hi. Um, <clears throat> thanks for having us. Uh, Ryan McLaren. I work for Congressman Peter Welch here in Vermont uh, in agriculture, obviously. Uh, I also, my portfolio also includes transportation, education, labor, and first responder issues. Um, and yeah, we'll dive into some of the details here in a minute, but um, Peter currently serves on um, energy and commerce, uh, government oversight and reform, and the House Select Committee um, on Intelligence, uh, which is kind of rare. He's on three committees, but so he's got a lot of work, but we're looking forward to working with the new administration and um, hopeful not only that we have more in terms of COVID relief here in the near future, but um, we can move forward on some of the more pressing issues like climate change and um, some of the other things that have been pent up for the last few years. So uh yeah i'll leave it there let andrew introduce himself and we'll dive into some of the details yeah uh um, sure. welcome andrew thank you mr chair um andrew barenberg with senator Leahy's office as tom said uh i am his counterpart in the senator's dc office um working on a range of natural resource issues but uh agriculture included um i will just briefly touch on uh the process that we anticipate going forward for Secretary Vilsack's confirmation. Um, we are in a, in a bit of a, a limbo here. Well, um, leaders McConnell and um, Schumer negotiate an organizing resolution for the Senate. So technically, um, Democrats are do not yet chair the Ag Committee, which means we've not been able to set a date for a hearing. Um, Though Senator Leahy was able to meet with uh, Secretary Vilsack via Zoom, of course, last week, um, and was able to reiterate his priorities for Vermont, including dairy, um, including the importance of nutrition programs uh, to our state. Um, Secretary Vilsack is, is, of course, well aware of um, Vermont priorities, having worked with the delegation over the eight-year period during the Obama administration. So. Um, looking forward to him getting into place. Um, I'll also just briefly mention, announced this morning, um, the Biden administration announced a few uh, nutrition-related executive orders, most notably um, expanding the pandemic EBT program um, by as much as 15%. Um, so although it remains to be seen the, the pace at which uh, Congress can pass another coronavirus stimulus, and of course, um, Biden has put his preferred plan out um, at $1.9 trillion. Um, we certainly are, are starting to see some of the, the quick executive actions that, that they're able to take um, to try and rework some of the formulas um, and try and get as much support out to, to folks who need nutrition assistance um, as quickly as possible. So hopefully we'll see more of that yeah. as it comes. Well, that all that all sounds good, and we uh, our committee has been charged uh, by our leadership here in Vermont to uh, work on food security, uh, nutrition for all, uh, you know, uh, from school children to our senior uh, citizens, and uh, uh, you know that it's really been. Uh, the money that's flowed to us so far has been very helpful in making sure everybody uh, has been fed and, and cared for. Um, a couple of issues in the nutrition area that we've talked about and we've heard from our constituents in regards to, um, and I don't know, you know if it's going to be able to happen, but it's out of Washington. 
uh, that would have to have. Uh, we've had a, quite a few um, farmers and enrolled groups uh, ask about trying to move to whole milk in schools, school lunch programs, um, to try to get away from, um, you know, the skim milk or what the heck ever they're using 2% to boost that up. And the other big issue that would, that we've heard about that would really make a difference in Vermont is a universal meals program. And, uh, you know, we, we've worked on that, trying to do it on a statewide basis, but financially we've never been in a position here in Vermont to, or our towns haven't to be able to pull that off. But during this past year, with the help of what you folks have been getting done in, in Washington, uh, it's basically worked into a universal meals program where all kids at school uh, schools at the age of one are from K, K through or preschool through 18 years of age eat for free. And, and it's, it's really made a major difference uh, for, for our folks. So um, I don't know if any of the other committee members have something they want to throw in here or not, but we'll, if not, we'll get right to uh, the program, uh, Corey. Yeah, I just want to reiterate the whole milk. Um, you know, I've only been Franklin County Senator going into my second term, but in both my campaigns and in my time in the House before that, you know, just even symbolically having the ability to um, to have whole milk in the schools is is critical to our farmers. And you know, you know, you look at a lot of communities where these kids are drinking whole milk at home because they're producing the milk, and they go into their school and and are being told it's not nutritious for them, or or you know, it's not great. I think that that causes an issue. Um, and then you know, you know, I'm really excited. You know, with with the shifts in Washington. And, and where our federal delegation is, I think, you know, we punch what we've always punched well above our weight, but even, even more so now, um, you know, we look at what DFA and some of the other groups have done on cutting back on um, production, you know, that 15%, that's hurt a lot of our farmers and folks are being creative in Franklin County with bottling their own milk and finding resources, but anything, you know, that we can do to help them kind of localize some of their production and take some of the surplus milk that can't go to the co-ops, if you will, that, you know, they can do some cool stuff with, I think would, would be helpful and just to have on your radar. Yep. Thank you, Corey. Uh, Senator Pearson. Yeah, thank you. Just uh, in a related uh, ag thing, but not dairy specifically, we, we've been looking at how to uh, boost uh, school meals and shift to universal and in particular try to get more local food into schools and what ha part of that challenge is unquestionably the in complexity that the federal government puts on schools and the uh, agency of ed does a really good job trying to navigate uh, between the federal government and local schools and i gather the the Republicans have been talking in recent years about a block grant kind of idea um, for states. And to me, there's, you know, I don't, I don't, I, I understand some of the concerns about that. But what I guess I, I wonder if it suggests that there is maybe some way to meet so that we get continue to get money in, hopefully maybe a little bit more money to support school nutrition, but also greater flexibility. I mean, it, it is, it is truly wild what the schools have to go through and we've just scratched the surface but i'm not sure it could be more complex so any any help you could you could give our schools uh and the state generally to um have a little more flexibility with some of that money would be greatly appreciated tom do you want me to jump in with a nutrition update um and then we can move to ag just to, since we're sort of been on the topic and then we can kind of move off of it and jump into CFAP um, and other other things. And I can I can wrap up maybe in, later with um, the small business PPP e idle provisions. Does that sound okay? Okay, great. 
Um, so the Vermont delegation, um, all three offices have been working incredibly closely this past year with um, the state agencies, DCF, um, Department of Health, and Agency of Education, uh, and uh, Agency of Agriculture on all of these uh, nutrition provisions. Vermont was incredible how quickly it pivoted and um, developed plans and used every possible waiver for, to, to have the flexibility to get, it, get food out to Vermonters. And it, it's really, it is really remarkable how well um, we did that in the state. And you also used your coronavirus relief funds incredibly well. Everyone Eats is a phenomenal model across the country. So kudos to that, thank you. Uh, so just a quick update on what, what kind of came into Vermont in 2020. We had um, about a normal year with SNAP, almost $100 million in 2020, which is, a, is actually not much more than a normal year, interestingly. I think some people didn't, um, because of their uh, unemployment income didn't, uh, that boost, they, they actually fell off SNAP. Um, there was a change in this newest that, that, the, um, that extra $300 boost won't actually count. So that, that will be helpful. But we had an, 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 emergen, uh, an emergency allotment and that brought in another $10 million into the state to, to families on SNAP. Um, and we also had, as Andrew mentioned, the pandemic EBT program. It's a really unique thing that went out to school kids um, who, uh, eat, who are either on a universal meals in a universal meal school or um, are free and reduced hot lunch uh, eligible. And that was $15 million to those families that received EB EBT cards. And a lot of those families actually aren't on SNAP. So it was really just a really incredible thing um, to help families get through. Uh, school meals, again, they pivoted, they were amazing, they did to go, they did the school bus routes, um, they used every waiver and flexibility, um, and in the most recent bill, there was a, uh, a reimbursement increase, because I, I think a lot of schools did uh, have some extra costs that were acute and cured, and, and basically, um, you know, from the to-go containers and, and all of that um, as well. Uh, just on the school meals topic, while everyone was talking about universal meals, uh, uh, Senator Sanders did introduce a bill last year with Congresswoman Omar. It's called the Universal School Meals Bill, and we are considering reintroducing it in this session uh, this year, this coming year. And, you know, there's also the child nutrition reauthorization, and that would be sort of an opportunity, again, to address things like whole milk, um, and other nutrition requirements in school, the streamlining and the simplification of some of the programs, it's extremely onerous and really cumbersome. All these different programs from the summer to the afternoon school to you know, the various types of ways that you can um, CEP and uh, way, ways you can try to work in the universal meals categorical eligibility, the list goes on, it's complicated. And so simplifying that in any way possible while we continue to work towards federally, federally funded universal meals for, for, all, for all, all children, yeah. yeah. And that would be, and we do have a local food, food, food procurement uh, extra reimbursement worked into that bill. So that's, that's definitely on the table and, and I would hope it would be if, if Vermont moves forward with any kind of state legislation for that. Um, Farmers to Families, that was the USDA program, and uh, the Abbey Group got the first two contracts, as you know. They had, um, I think, close to 600,000 boxes went out of uh, lots of local food to people. The next uh, two contracts were to uh, two different out-of-state companies, and then the most recent round, um, another a New Jersey company just got the bid. And that will bring in another 15,000 boxes. So it's, it's kind of disappointing that we didn't get an in-state contractor, but there will be some boxes. And I think you probably are all, all aware the Vermont Food Bank is running their own farmers to family program with their philanthropic dollars that they received. That's about 20,000 boxes that are they're currently having go out through the, about the um, early March. And uh, I think, yeah, I think I said that 20,000 boxes, I think for that. Is there, yeah. is there any way to control those contracts? Like, I mean, if 
if the Abbey Group had continued getting those, um, seems like it would have helped the employment in Franklin County and and basically yeah. all over Vermont to some extent, plus some of that produce that would have been locally uh, gathered rather than going to New, uh, New Jersey or yeah, wherever. No. I mean, that was a that was a you know a Trump administration uh, USDA decision. I know Senator Leahy was working very hard on you know ensuring that there was fair bids and and it, it ended up coming you know and and so to especially to try to get Abbey Group and Vermont vendors um, to be competitive and it, it ended up coming down to the lowest bidder and you know a lot of these were just these big huge companies. Um, it was pretty pretty disappointing of a program, but you know I, I think it's safe to say that um, with the Biden administration and uh, the the democratically controlled Senate, that if we ha if this program continues, we will see changes with it. I think there's yeah. a question of whether it will continue. We made the best of it in Vermont, but you know I think it wasn't an easy program and put a lot of the burden on, on uh, the charitable food system and didn't really help a lot of small, medium-sized farmers. So, uh, so yeah, so that was that. I think that's the nutrition update. Um, we also did see a, a WIC increase um, caseload in Vermont. So that was good. They, the Department of Health did a really great job there, got just about every waiver possible and uh, continued to serve I think they had about an 8% increase caseload. So, uh, any questions from any of the members? In regards, uh, just one quick one. Uh, in regards to the Universal Meals Program, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I think it would be important uh, if, if you folks, as you work on that and talk about it in DC, if even if you can't cover the the whole bill because it it's very expensive, um, you know I think I think a state like Vermont would participate in a cost sharing program. So if we got some money from you folks to get it going, and then we states could opt in to help out. Uh, and then the municipalities should, you know, they ought to have a little skin in the game as well. So, you know, local, state, and feds, I think, could put together a pretty, a pretty decent program where all our young people would be fed without having to carry cash to school and, and uh, you know, and all that. So... Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out. That's great to know, um, Senator Starr. And when uh, we reintroduce the bill, I'm happy to look, take a, that into consideration and um, share the bill with you if you want to take a look at it. Thanks. Yeah, be very interested. So, where, who's up next? Um, um, I, I could. Go, I can touch ahead, briefly Andrew. on the. Oh, sure. I was going to touch briefly on some of the dairy issues um, that you raised and that Senator Parent raised as well. Um, so on on uh, whole milk in schools, um, USDA did issue a few rules uh, in the last few years to allow for flexibility on uh, low fat flavored milk in schools. Um, yeah. Frankly, the last time uh, that Congress reauthorized um, the child nutrition reauthorization was 10 years ago now. Um, the Health, Healthy Hungry Free Kids Act was passed in 2010. Um, typically, that's uh, reauthorized every five years. Um, so certainly overdue for um, a, a new look at those programs. Uh, the outgoing chairman of the Senate Agriculture Committee Pat Roberts from Kansas um, made it his goal to get that done during the last Congress, but uh, obviously with, with plenty else going on, uh, I think the clock just ran out on that. Um, so certainly an issue and um, we, we've heard all the arguments um, about getting whole milk into schools. Uh, 
you know, my non-expert opinion is that whole milk is, is far better to drink and more delicious. Uh, and I think there's a, certainly an argument about starting kids, um, introducing them to milk by putting the, be the best dairy foot forward, I guess. Um, on the center, parent mentioned a lot of the very kind of creative pivoting that a lot of dairy farmers in Vermont have had to do. Um, certainly the, the CFAP payments and the, uh, the state program, particularly with all of its flexibility has helped um, provide a bit of a, a bridge and a cushion um, to allow for some of that creativity. But one, one additional program that I, I wanna mention is uh, the Northeast Dairy Business Innovation Center um, that the Agency of Agriculture recently announced um, that was uh, authorized in the 2018 Farm Bill uh, with the help of Senator Leahy uh, to, to establish three regional centers across the country. Um, of course, Vermont uh, applied, um, was successful in, in landing that bid. Um, and since then, uh, Senator Leahy has been able to increase the funding for that program to $20 million a year. $22 million a year in the, in the FY21 bill. Um, and that's thus far has been divided equally among the three centers. So that uh, certainly was in the works prior to the, the beginning of the pandemic, um, but, but certainly couldn't uh, come any sooner. And part of the uh, intent of that program is to help dairy producers diversify their products, reach new markets, um, things like rotational grazing, it's a whole range. And, and now with um, you know, at minimum $6 million a year coming to Vermont for, for that specific purpose, I think that'll um, both help farmers capitalize on the, the creativity and pivoting that they've already done, um, but also you know, help, help to expand that um, and increase their resilience to, to the types of market disruptions that you know, we've certainly seen before this pandemic, but um, reached new levels in the last year. <clears throat> are, are you all set, Andrew? Yes, excuse me. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> I'll stop there. <laughs> Kick it over to Ryan, maybe. Yeah. Um, any questions for Andrew uh, that's fresh in your minds? Uh, or we'll we'll uh, go on to Ryan or Tom. Maybe Tom. Um, Poor beauty. What, what I, I'd be happy. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> You know, uh, thank you, thank you, uh, Senator Starr, for uh, your recognition uh, early on of, of how important the federal support was. Um, you know, I, I can quickly summarize because there were a lot of programs. Um, I'll talk more about the direct payments to uh, Vermont agricultural producers. Um, this sets aside any small business programs or the nutrition programs like the uh, the food box program, but. Through what we came to know as CFAP 1 and CFAP 2, as well as the uh, CRF that were federal dollars that the Vermont legislature got uh, involved with. Obviously, you all got pretty deeply involved in that and did a good job putting those out the door. Um, the uh, total and direct payments to Vermont agricultural producers among those three programs was uh, $104 million uh, last year. And in addition, although it wasn't Corona relief, uh, the NRCS put about $11 million out the door in conservation funding to Vermont farmers continuing their programs despite the pandemic. And so in total among the CRF, the uh, um, CFAP and the NRCS equip program, there was about, uh, about $115 million that um, hit the ground in Vermont uh, in payments, direct payments to agricultural producers. So uh, it was an unprecedented level of support uh, at a very important time. Uh, and uh, I mean, the committee can be proud of your role in helping to put it out. Some of the USDA programs didn't roll out quite as quickly as we would have liked in the spring, but ultimately they got up and running. Where we are at this time uh, is that the USDA there was a, a uh, coronavirus relief bill that was passed just before the end of the year. Uh, in case you missed it, there was a lot going on, what with the election and other interesting things. But um, there was a, a relief bill that was passed and, and that among other things, 
adds funding to the uh, CFAP um, program. And late last week, the USDA put out notice that they're continuing, uh, maybe I haven't seen it called this, but maybe CFAP 2.5. Uh, and that's the program that can make direct payments to dairies as well as uh, diversified uh, agriculture from, you know, uh, specialty crops to maple. And it provides producers with the opportunity to come back in and uh, have another run at the CFAP program to adjust where they landed uh, in the first round. I haven't seen a lot of details or um, talk with any farmers who have been back in, but certainly directing any uh, farmers who you uh, deal with who are looking for additional federal support or feel maybe they need to adjust where they landed under the CFAP programs to contact their uh, FSA office to engage uh, in, in those programs going forward. So the, uh, as has been, met, I think Andrew or, or maybe Erica mentioned, the first thing we'll see out of the gate with the new administration as far as uh, assistance will be through the, uh, the plan that President Biden has announced in uh, $1.9 trillion uh, in, in COVID relief. And the agricultural component of that is not well-defined, but um, the, there is a lot of attention given in what we've seen so far to nutrition and to supporting schools. And so some of what you talked about related to school meals and nutrition will certainly be uh, part of the priorities. And I see my colleague, uh, Polly has joined us. I, I saw a quick note, help Polly, when uh, you were considering your interest in, in uh, the school meals programs and nutrition, uh, uh, certainly Erica and Ryan and Andrew covered those issues, but Polly is the Senator's lead on nutrition in Vermont. So she's been able to join us too. Well, Polly, it's great to have you with us. We're all very hungry this morning. Um, <laughs> You bring us any nutritious food? Uh, just kidding. Uh, welcome, uh, welcome. And we've talked quite a bit earlier in regards to uh, you know universal meals and uh, uh, farm to family foods, uh, all kinds of uh, food issues, and uh, very interested in that. And I don't know if. It, I think, Tom, the thing you were just talking about, maybe uh, Polly could tell us more about in regards to nutrition, but these are based, are they going to be run by the federal government or will that, that be passed through to like the states to, to manage? Do you know how that, the, how it's going to work? So thanks for having me. I'm uh, glad to be part of this conversation. I think we'll have many more in the future. And um, you, I'm sure, heard a good summary of the nutrition provisions in the last bill and what we can see coming up from Erica and, and Ryan. We work very close on these issues. Um, with regards to whether it will be passed through to the states or will be managed through the federal government, it's going to depend on, um, on the individual funding source so the, the next bill leans heavily on um, funding through existing federal programs, I believe, and many of those are run through the federal government and kind of sub-granted uh, with guidelines through the states, such as the existing school meal program. Um, so the, the large programs with the state discretion, like the Coronavirus Relief Fund, um, are kind of TBD. Yep. Um, Senator Colmore. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I picked up on uh, a couple of uh, times, and I think Ryan mentioned it and Tom did as well. And by the way, I just want to echo our chair's uh, thanks for your efforts on behalf of Vermonters with uh, the last round of CRF. It was, uh, it's just really nice to know we have some people that are working hard for all of us uh, in Washington. And, and uh, so thank you for all your efforts. Uh, you mentioned a 1.9 trillion. That at least is uh, what the number is right now. That probably isn't going to be the exact number at the end of the, the drive. But is it likely that Vermont will get the same part of that 
In other words, we got 1.2 billion from the last round of CRF funding. Is it likely, and I realize you're, you don't have a crystal ball, so you don't know, but is it likely we're gonna get about the same sort of cut of the pie? From what I've seen and what's been outlined thus far, it lays out a, a lot more uh, channels for the money to flow through. The CARES Act was, you know, uh, very, it needed to be very quick. And so there was not a lot of detail in the legislation as far as the rollout of those dollars. And it was possible to say, here's this big chunk of money that's going to come to states at their discretion. And uh, the Vermont delegation, you know, Senator Leahy and his work on appropriations, three of his favorite words are small state minimum. And, uh, and I know the other members of the delegation worked on that as well. But I guess that's the long answer. The short answer is I don't know um, what the Vermont share may sugar off to. Uh, but it'll be harder to apply a small state minimum to a big bundle of those dollars would be my perception because it's going to be a lot more targeted to schools, to towns, to states, to businesses, um, and not come out in, in a few large pieces where it's pretty easy to attach a small state minimum. I don't know if others uh, among the delegation staff. No, I think that's right. You know, I don't, I, I also don't know, <laughs> but um, I think, you know, one of the differences in the concept of state and local aid in the new bill is that it would, tr it could truly be local, at least what came out of the house at the end of last year, um, not even the end, in the middle of last year in May, um, included funding directly to municipalities. So how that changes the proportion of what goes to the state and what goes to towns, I don't know. But, um, you know, it's, it's a centerpiece of the plan uh, state and local aid. So that at the very least is positive. Yep. And we have a summary of that bill um, that I can share with um, your committee clerk who can share it with you. And that lays out the um, Biden's proposal for how that money will flow through from this federal government. Yeah, that would, that would be most helpful if you could send Linda a copy uh, of that, then we can, um, you know, work, uh, work uh, from that. Yep. That'd Thank be you. real good. Will do. Yep. Um, questions of uh, the committee. Uh, so we, we're down to uh, uh, the clean water issue in the environmental sector of, uh, you know, our natural resources committee looks at that and, and they, uh, they sort of think they have a full jurisdiction over that, but um, our dairy farms and in, in ag lands, um, you know, cover a lot of clean water issues, and so we're we in the ag committee are very um, involved with that, working through the ag agency and natural resources, and you know. I, well, you folks would know because you're from Vermont here, uh, but our farmers have done a, a pretty damn good job uh, putting in uh, different uh, water quality improvements on the farms of no-till and, and cover cropping. And, and uh, you know, they've really done well to help with with our water quality problem that we have in the lake. And so um, could you give us any more info on the environmental side of what's happening in DC to help with water quality? I'll take a first swing at that if, if okay with folks. Um, you know, certainly the federal government plays a huge role in helping farmers and uh, you've probably already had farmers in to testify or, or heard from others, you know, you, Vermont Agency of Agriculture that as far as phosphorus reductions thus far under the TMDL, well over 90% of the um, accountable phosphorus reductions have been made by the agricultural sector, primarily dairy farms. And 60% uh, um, of that has been paid for with federal dollars uh, under NRCS. So 
to the extent we're making progress on our phosphorus skulls under the TMDL, you know, agriculture is way out ahead. And, uh, you know, they were early on the, the regulated community and had the biggest um, chunk handed to them or to bite off uh, in under the TMDL. So there's been a lot of progress made there. Um, you know, with, with that said, there was a tremendous focus. And now NRCS uh, in Vermont is going through a strategic planning process and uh, our state uh, our state director, uh, state conservationist, Vicki Drew, um, would be good to hear from on this, where they're asking questions now of stakeholder groups, including farmers, as to whether they maintain an absolute laser beam focus on ag water quality or whether they um, take a look at some of the other programs that they can also work with under EQIP. Uh, and the total dollars of available for ag conservation work are determined in the farm bill and uh, it's not annual appropriations, uh, but we've got solid farm bill funding and Secretary Vilsack pushed a little extra money Vermont's way uh, when he, you know, in, last time he sat in that seat. So we'll certainly be in touch with him, but I think the, we're always looking at the next farm bill and, and the conservation programs, but those programs are in place. One thing you'll see with this administration uh, is the, um, you know, it really doesn't impact Vermont that much, but the one law that uh, I know is, is um, of great interest to the ag community is the waters of the United States, WOTUS, uh, and what waters fall within federal jurisdiction. And nationally, uh, farms and agricultural groups have uh, pushed back against federal jurisdiction, and the, the uh, Trump administration had adopted rules that greatly uh, loosen federal or reduce federal jurisdiction, uh, we can expect to see, I think, the Biden administration move in a different direction on that. It's a very slow process. And the uh, ultimately, the impact in Vermont isn't all that significant because the federal, I mean, the, the state water quality regulations and the required agricultural practices probably go beyond what um, may or may not uh, fall within the jurisdiction as determined by uh, the Clean Water Act and waters of the U.S. So yep. uh, that's sort of where we stand at this point. I don't know if others have more to add. Um, I'll jump in if that's all right. Um, sure. Thank you. Uh, just, to, just to add a few things, uh, kind of foreshadowing what might be to come um, based on his public comments and uh, conversation with the Senator last week, Secretary Vilsack um, and the Biden administration, I guess more generally, um, do plan to make climate change uh, a top priority. Uh, as that applies to USDA, um, the secretary and his transition staff have been talking about finding new ways to incentivize um, you know, climate smart ag practices. Um, one of the vehicles uh, would be the $30 billion Commodity Credit Corporation um, that is an existing authority at USDA that, that the Trump administration and Secretary Purdue primarily used um, for direct payments to producers to offset uh, the, the trade war impact. Um, but the flexibility baked into that account um, you know, could allow a lot of direct payments for um, different types of practices, including um, you know, water quality, I'm sure. I mean, there's plenty of overlap, of course, between you know things like cover cropping and soil health, um, climate change, and water quality. Um, the you know the secretary comes from um, the dairy sector. I mean, in the between being ag secretary and now he served as the CEO of the U.S. Dairy Export Council. Um, so between I think this delegation uh, and and the secretary's uh, interest in and work in dairy, I would expect um, certainly dairy to have a seat at that table uh, as those dollars uh, are being allocated. Yeah. Um, Erica, did you have something you wanted to add or court? Well, Corey, Senator Parent has a question. Well, not really a question. I just think too, along with water quality and what we're doing for dairy farmers as um, you know, we're taking the steps to, to really mitigate the impacts of climate change in Washington now. Um, anything we can do for even pilot programs on 
uh, carbon sequestration on our farms and other projects. I know our farmers are very um, interested in, in figuring out a new revenue stream there. So um, I know your delegation, our delegation's excited probably about that work, but you know, let's keep our guys at the uh, top of the list for that if we can. Um, any other questions from uh, committee members right now? No? Uh, so Erica, did you have uh, a question uh, or a statement or? Um, I, if, if you'd like, if you uh, would like, I'm happy to give a quick small business update. Um, I know Ryan also had a few other just sort of loose ends and other pieces of the bill he wanted to, uh, or just of the last relief bill he wanted to share as well. Um, but if you're already really familiar with the new changes to PPP and IDA, like I can skip that. Yeah, and Ryan, you want to jump in? Uh, we need support over in the house as well. So uh, <laughs> I, think, I think we're in good shape on the Senate side. We are um, in very good shape on the Senate side, <laughs> <laughs> Senator. Um, I just had a few, uh, I think, odds and ends from the coronavirus relief package that aren't specific to ag, but are important, um, I think, to highlight, particularly for rural communities um, in Vermont and anywhere else across the country. Um, obviously, we talked about the CRF funds the first round, and I'm sure you all know that the, the deadline for that for spending that money has been extended to the end of um, 2021. So I know we did a great job getting that money out the door. You all did, but uh, there's a little bit more of a, a longer time horizon on that. Um, I hope your constituents have started seeing uh, the, the second round of direct payments, um, $600 to everyone. Um, we're hearing from a lot of folks that had, we heard from a, a, a lot of constituents that had problems the first time around that didn't see it or thought they got shortchanged. So if you hear any, if you hear from constituents about that, just feel free to send them our way. Um, and what else am I looking at here? Uh, Erica can touch on the small business stuff. There's a lot of really great changes, particularly for farmers. Um, so hopefully we'll see more small farmers uh, be, take advantage of those things. So I'll let her talk about that. Um, there was $3 billion in additional funding for the provider relief funds, which goes to um, hospitals and healthcare providers, which uh, is has been a lifeline uh, for particularly the rural healthcare, healthcare system. Um, it's kept uh, hospitals, um, yep. smaller hospitals afloat. Uh, there's $250 million in there for telehealth, which I, I think has been an important lifeline for folks um, that aren't able to access uh, healthcare easily or they have to travel a long way or they're at risk. So that's positive. Um, obviously, the unemployment um, programs, pandemic unemployment programs have been extended through March 14th, which um, I know our governor had talked a lot about um, and uh, was, has, is essential for so many folks. Um, and then one other uh, change is the, the spending package waived the cost matching requirement for Northern Border Regional Commission grants, yep. um, which will be great for communities in your neck of the woods, Senator Starr and Senator yeah. Perry. Actually, I mean, really everywhere except Channing County um, now. So uh, a, a good forward-looking um, uh, win for us. Um, and then finally, I think uh, you might have seen some uh, press about it, but Peter was the House lead um, on what we call the Save Our Stages Act, which was $15 billion, which is not a small amount of money um, dedicated for small independent um, music venues or theaters, um, performing yeah. art spaces. So, you know, the Paramount Theater in Rutland, for example, the Flynn in Burlington um, would be eligible to, uh, for this new program that 
was intended to keep them afloat throughout this crisis because you know they're well you know the first to close and might be the last to reopen um after this pandemic and they're obviously vital parts of um our communities here in vermont and across the country so um that was a huge win both for you know peter but especially for the folks that are operating these uh venues yeah um, what about, we haven't talked about, I don't think, um, a lot of, uh, there's been a lot of discussion here in Vermont in regards to extending broadband out to the rural areas. Um, is there, yeah, it's, and I'm sure you've all heard this, uh, we, we as a state don't have the money alone to, to fund that, and people's have talked about, well, what we need is a program like rural electrification had back in the late 30s uh, to, to get this, finally get this done. Uh, is there money in any of these different programs that would help uh, push broadband uh, to, you know, the, the last house or into the rural communities. Yeah, there absolutely was. And it's, you know, rural, the broadband issue has been something Peter's worked on his whole career and plans to work on into the future because we haven't quite solved it. The top the top line number from the bill was $7 billion. So like not, not, not nothing to shake a stick at. Um, and included Ryan 300 Linda. million uh, directed towards rural areas. I'm not the, our broadband expert, so I don't know exactly how that money is gonna flow into um, those communities, but it also included 65 million to complete broadband maps because to have a real, um, an accurate estimate of what, um, an accurate understanding of what areas are in need. Because if you rely on the providers, they basically will tell you that every inch of the state is covered with cell and broadband. And um, we know that that's not true. Um, and the, the uh, $250 million in telehealth funding I, I talked about is, is, is um, really broadband funding. It's through an FCC program that um, is intended to extend, make sure people have the ability to access telehealth through broadband. Um, so there's some money there for that as well. And then there's three, uh, three and a quarter billion dollars for low income, um, a low income uh, broadband program uh, through the FCC's lifeline program. So it, it's, it would provide, um, I think $50 a month to households that are eligible for that program or, or um, are eligible for, for Pell Grants, um, recently unemployed or are eligible for free and reduced lunch. So that's, you know, cash to the consumer to help pay for broadband. It doesn't solve the access issue, but um, it, it will help with folks that don't have access for economic reasons. And we, Senator Sarr, we also just had $32 million come into the state through um, the F, uh, FCC program. Um, uh, the, um, the rural digital program that, that they run. You probably all know that the, the USDA program, we, we don't have an easy time accessing um, any, at, the, at, at this point. So most of those funds in the last bill, um, a lot of those will go through grant programs rather than the state block grant that we were hoping for. So we, we do need a lot more money. It will hopefully be in infrastructure bills in the future. Um, we know we need to have a, a massive federal investment in this, as you said. Um, yeah. But we did get that to four providers, that 32 million. So those are that's already starting to be rolled out. There's a map if you're interested. I'm happy to, I don't know if I can dig it right now to put in the chat by 10 o'clock we are at right now. Um, but I'm happy to send that to Linda. Um, and it yeah. has a map of all of the, um, it's, it was put together by, um, by DPS in Vermont. So, but it, I'm happy to send it to you. So you could send that to Linda when you get it and she'll disperse it, you know, get it out to us. Sure. Um, well, um, I guess we're running out of time. Are there any other questions from any of the committee members uh, to our delegation that are with us? And, and 
And I am happy to send you some a summary. Are you? I guess you're probably all up to speed on the PPP and the idle changes because um, they were pretty significant for farmers. So, um, but if you're not, I'm happy to send you a written summary of that. Yeah, that wouldn't do any harm. We try to stay abreast of it, but uh, you know, with everything that's happening, you miss some things. Um, well, you know, in in the future, if there's anything that we can help you folks with, um, you know, feel free to, to uh, call on us and um, wanna thank, thank all of you for your time this morning and uh, thank you for your hard work you've been doing and wish you well into the next year to help us some more. <laughs> um, so thanks a lot and um, we, um, we appreciate your time. Thank you, Senator. Thank you. Hopefully we'll see you in person by then. <laughs> yeah, I hope so. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, so committee, we, we have somebody with us. Uh, I don't really know who he is, but somebody's on our screen. Uh, hey, did any of you want to take a quick break before we get started? You want to take a break, Michael? That'd be lovely, Senator. Thank you. <laughs> um, why don't we? Uh, why don't we take, you know, a couple of minutes and five minutes, and then we'll be right back and be with you, Michael. You can get your thoughts all in a row um, to. Give us a good uh, a good presentation. I'm on it, Senator. Thank you. Yeah, we'll catch you in a minute. 